Here, Gautier's team is setting up for what's known as a forward air control maneuver. His group is trained to guide the fire of helicopters or fighter aircraft. All right, y'all, welcome back to Combat Arms Channel. Now, in today's video, we're checking out the French Special Forces. Now, this wasn't a recommendation that I was getting from any of y'all. It's just something that I wanted to check out personally. We've already checked out the French GIGN, and that was that was iconic because, again, the GIGN are very badass. So I think French Special Forces is a good place to take it off from here. So checking out French units, you got you always got to check out the, the Special Forces and see how they're doing it. And again, France gets a lot of crap for their military, you know, surrendering and whatnot all the time. But you can imagine when you're talking about Special Forces, it's going to be the best of the best. So that's a good way to sort of... Uh, gauge how the uh, how the military does it in general so i'm definitely excited to check it out and see how the french special forces do it now again before we start if you guys aren't subscribed definitely feel free to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell so you're notified whenever i upload the next video especially if you guys have noticed that you've been coming back to check out more of my videos you know it's it's totally free and if you don't want to check out a particular video then you know you don't need to click on it but you definitely don't want to miss out on any cool stuff like the french special forces so yeah, I guess let's uh, let's get into it and see how the French Special Forces does it. This is a pretty decent looking video. It's in English, so that's always nice because I can't understand any French. <laughs> Some 90s graphics right here. Okay, interesting start. Very dramatic already. We get to do some extraordinary things. Not everyone is able to jump out of a plane with a boat, land in the water, carry out a marine raid, arrive on land, carry out an action, and exfiltrate by sea. I'd say most people don't want to do that either. I think that's unique, and that's what I came looking for. Hell yeah. What I like is the way we get to push ourselves to the limit, constantly, always searching, innovating, always looking to go the extra mile. Okay. It's a unique job within the army, there's no doubt about it. It takes a lot to do this job. There are very few people, unfortunately, with the ability to do what we do, so you have to be able to get the right enjoyment from it. I make the most of it, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can imagine anyone who's going special forces who's trying so hard to get into a particular unit, they need to really make the, the best out of it. And of course, they're going to be happy wherever they are just because they're surrounded by people that also want to be there because they've already proved it themselves. But again, it's not it's not just hard work getting into it whenever you are into that special forces unit. It's going to require a lot of work from you on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's good. You got people who are serious about it and understand that who are actually going into this field. Third dimension? What does that mean? Sick. You don't know their names or faces, yet they're constantly at work in every corner of the globe. Freeing hostages, hmm. fighting piracy, arresting war criminals, awesome. or carrying out commando raids. The 3,300 men of the Special Operations Command, known as COS, are involved in all kinds of operations, often in the most extreme conditions. Okay, we're already seeing like so many different weapons, so many different like pieces of gear. So here we can see these guys utilizing uh, MP5s. We have Glocks. These guys have uh, you know face shields and whatnot, similar to what we saw in the GIGN. But that their kit definitely looks a little more modernized, especially for like maritime sort of operations. So we saw those. We got um, looks like an HK416 possibly with a. A laser and an ACOG optic. I love the hoods or the like the shoals they have over their heads. That looks super badass. That's what we saw with like the uh, the Danish frogmen. Or that's usually what you would attribute them with. But okay, very interesting gear so far. Now we can see they got a helo. So let's see what's going on in this scene. We've been invited to follow them as they explain what their unique job entails and their often extraordinary day-to-day -day lives. The soldiers we spoke to specialize in airborne operations. Mm. In the language of the special forces, the third dimension. Okay, interesting. Never heard that one before. Mm. 
Nice kit though. Some nice rifles. Nice helmets. Hell yeah. For ensuring freedom of action and infiltration in enemy territory, the third dimension is ideal. It allows stealthy movement, speed, and discretion. The big differences between the conventional army and a special forces army are in the way we do things, the way we work. We definitely more specialized. Groups. Generally, we go in first to open up a theater, to be able to anticipate and facilitate the arrival of conventional forces behind us. Mm. We've got people who are like everyone else. We just work differently. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's another important thing. A lot of people never really get the distinction between special forces. They they probably just think that special forces work alongside the conventional military, but they just more, they do more like the high risk stuff. Now you will have the conventional military supporting special operations sometimes, but again, you can see them going ahead of everyone else, going ahead of like the main body, so to speak, just to actually get a foothold in whatever you know, terrain they're actually going to. So it's nice that they're making that distinction in this video because a lot of people just have no clue, especially people who aren't in the military. Whether they're part of the Army, Navy, or Air Force, the COS units are a group of specially trained units equipped with the most advanced systems to carry out targeted missions in record time. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's keeping a this record is the case of it. With parachutists like Dorian, who carry out high altitude jumps known as Haho jumps. I've been with the RPMA for 16 years now. Sheesh. And I belong to the Aquila group, which is a Haho group. I came to parachuting first and foremost for the adrenaline rush, and also because in my job, it's an advantage. Let's say it's a cut above the rest, in terms of the difficulty of what we can do and the prestige it brings. True. It takes special people to do something like that. Tonight, as before every jump, Dorian and the other parachutists check their equipment meticulously. Oxygen mask to ensure sufficient respiration. Navigation system with GPS and compass. Hmm. Night vision goggles for orientation with extreme precision, even at night. And special clothing. Just a handful of commandos are able to make these extremely technical, demanding jumps. Yeah, it's really cool how we get to see it from like this end where they're actually preparing everything because some people probably just get the idea that, you know, this is all prepared for them. Like you do have parachute riggers in the actual military who would prepare some of the stuff, but like these guys especially are more specialized. So they need to know their equipment a lot better and they need to be comfortable with it because their job requires something that's a lot of, even other airborne troops doesn't really require from them. Starting from an altitude of 7,000 meters, they require the parachutists to use ultra-sophisticated equipment. The first issue is the cold, of course, because the higher you go, the colder it gets. So that's quite a significant constraint. Fortunately, we've got some quite high-performance kit for that now. <laughs> then there's the pre-jump stress, because this is a jump where you're alone from the moment you exit the aircraft to the moment you land. Mm. Nice. It's cool how it's like such a small group of people too. <laughs> These high altitude jumps enable the commandos to reach their zone of operations discreetly with their full kit which can weigh up to 260 kilos, as seen here. That's crazy. So that dude just riding that card out. That's awesome. I like the ambiance with this uh, music going on. There are some pretty cool shots in this in this video so far. Again, when you're talking about high altitude, they do it for a specific reason, so they can be Once they've exited a little the more plane, undetected. The parachutists can navigate beneath their canopy, sometimes gliding dozens of kilometers in the pitch black. <laughs> From time to time, you might see a canopy. That'll reassure you a little. You'll tell yourself that you're not completely alone. <laughs> but yes, there are some nerves before the jump. Once you've jumped, you forget them and get on with the job. Makes sense. Again, 
since their job is so specialized and there's only a specific amount of people that can actually do their job, you can imagine they're getting the best kit that they can. Especially you can see they have the dual tube night vision and you can bet that they keep those up to date just so that they have the best depth perception, they have the best, you know, vision in general. You know, that you have the uh, the white phosphor night vision right now, which uh, adds a little bit more like uh, situational awareness just because it's a little bit clearer. And again, you have pretty solid depth perception when you have dual tubes. So you can imagine they're getting the best for their job just because, again, it's so specialized. There's not a whole lot of people that can actually fulfill that role. Some units, like the CPA-10, the Parachute Commando, complete their specific expertise with a solid grounding in aeronautics. It's a solid pilot. Here, Gauthier's team is setting up for what's known as a forward air control maneuver. Hmm. His group is trained to guide the fire of helicopters or fighter aircraft. Okay. So I guess I'd be like the a ground, JTAC. They designate targets for the aircraft, giving the exact coordinates accurate to a meter. Yeah, so that'd be like, I guess, a JTAC or maybe just a general forward observer. Now you do have specialized people kind of like this in the Marine Corps. It's the uh, Anglico. Which is basically like the uh, the gunfire liaisons for like naval gunship and everything. But this seems more like a JTAC or you know a forward observer. And you have these all over, and you have specialized people in the special forces who are just you know experienced and uh, they're they're used to working with different aircraft and specific aircraft that you would see in use with special forces. But you can imagine they're going to be pretty good at their job, and it's just like second nature at this point for them to to call in those fires. Twenty degrees. Major difficulty, ensuring that the team on the ground and the aircraft are both looking at the same thing and calculating the attack coordinates as precisely as possible. That's sick though. Yeah, some nice equipment. <laughs> to deal with the objective optimally, the CPA-10 teams have recently developed a real-time communication system, allowing them to keep radio transmissions to a minimum. Hmm. That's awesome. Capable of seizing and mobilizing an airport to allow the intervention of conventional forces, the men of the CPA-10 can also create a landing strip out of any parts or anywhere in the world. That's hmm. the work of the combat controllers on the ground. The roles we perform specifically, unlike other units, are setting up and reconnoitering any kind of rough terrain. It's an important job if, you, land if you need that. on terrain we've scouted beforehand. We can create a landing strip in the middle of the desert. <laughs> oh, and you, you can bet that takes a, like a specific level of attention to detail. When you're working with a bunch of different aircraft, it takes you knowing the capabilities of each aircraft. You know, what sort of uh, length they need for the runway, how much space they need to actually land and, and everything. Especially if you're working with different equipment, if you're offloading certain equipments. Yeah, I'm sure there's a whole lot of like math and a bunch of crazy stuff involved with that. So I've never even heard of anyone actually being able to do that. It totally makes sense, but I'm not sure how specialized they get with, you know, each aircraft and what they're actually doing to make sure that they have enough room, make sure the the, uh, the soil and the terrain is adequate. But yeah, that's, again, that's an awesome capability, especially for a special forces unit. When it comes to guiding a 50 ton plane traveling at 200 kilometers per hour <laughs> into land, there's no room for improvisation. But you can imagine those pilots are Pretty spot on too. Yeah, that can go wrong super easily. All it takes is that thing just to, to skid In out. Dark, the exercise is even more perilous. <sighs> Here, the transport plane coming into land is flying with cargo bay and lights lit. 
Special Forces aircraft usually fly with all lights off. One of the techniques used during Operation Serval launched in Mali in January 2013. The first interventions involved crews from the Poitou Transport Squadron. Wow. The Poitou took part in Operation Serval, when the Special Forces went in first and was then followed by conventional forces in the main zones that were secured. So that involved landing, taking zones at night where we infiltrated personnel and vehicles in each zone, and then we provided support to the forces put in place for those operations. That was an the awesome shot. Special Forces have been a frontline asset since their creation over 70 years ago. Mm. Oh, this is cool. In 1941, the first commandos were already training for lightning raid operations. Dozens of French volunteers were selected to train. Uh, it looks cool that they're able to climb the rope like that, but dude, that just destroys your elbows. Like. I used to do that to try and like show off or what have you. <laughs> Normally I can go up easily. Dude, doesn't that kill your elbows and shit? But dude, my elbows just got absolutely destroyed doing that over and over again. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. And I mean, it's not really practical if you can use your legs and you should definitely use that as a break for when you're climbing the rope. But I mean, yeah, it definitely shows your physical fitness if you're able to do that then you uh, definitely have some solid upper body strength. So that's pretty solid. I mean, it's interesting training for sure. It's cool to see the historics of how their units actually started off and what sort of training they were going through. French volunteers were selected to train with the British forces under uh -huh. the command of Lieutenant Commander Philippe Kiefer. They went on to become the premier bataillon de fusilier commando and 177 okay. of them landed on the Normandy beaches on the 6th of June, 1944. Badass, good stuff. Fifty years later, after the first Gulf War, the idea of unifying the different commando units took shape. Hmm. In 1992, France adopted a permanent command structure for these special units, the existing Commandement des Opérations Spéciales, or COS. Along with the US and the UK, France is currently one of the few countries to have an asset like the COS, with high-level, dedicated air resources. Mm, okay. We provide support to COS units on the ground, whether it's by dropping or by landing. We carry out pathfinding missions, which are part of the role of the special forces, meaning we're first into the theater or we exfiltrate COS personnel from hostile environments. We also sometimes gather intelligence for the ground troops and post-action intelligence. Hmm. Now I've seen a similar unit like that back in the day, and that's when, so there's something in the US military called spy rigging, which is a special patrol insert and extract. And that's a lot of times you'd see them use using spy rigging for extracting people, especially for like special operations or a small group of guys and they they're like in a really weird terrain and they just need a, a like a helicopter to come and extract them that's where you would see spy rigging coming into play so i wonder if they implement helicopters with any of their inserts or extra extracts because right now it just seems like it's um you know all planes and and whatnot so i don't know i guess we'll have to see if they really implement helicopters so much we saw a little bit of fast roping for that insert aspect but again, it's cool to see uh, helicopters used for the, the extraction too, especially spy rigging. But that's very nuanced and you, you need a certain, you need certain terrain to actually get that to work effectively. Like the crews of the Puerto squadron, those of the 4th Special Forces Helicopter Regiment have their own particular areas of expertise. Weird. <laughs> we do a lot of intelligence gathering, which allows us mm. to scout the zone and open up a route for other helicopters behind us. Dude, that's badass. And we carry elite snipers to really provide specific support and surgical strikes during assaults, or to suppress specific threats and support the commandos on the ground as closely as possible. Okay. Wow, okay, I guess that's answering that question. We're that is in advance of the other forces. We reconnoitre the zone, 
give the green light, secure the immediate vicinity around the zone of action, facilitate landing, and we can also provide information directly because we're in contact with the commandos. We give them intelligence about potential threats which might arrive around the zone of action. Dude, badass pilots. For rapid infiltration or exfiltration, air assets are essential to the special forces units. There we go. The hellhole. These action groups use a fast roping technique to descend. Fast roping is a lot of fun. In the identified zone, another unit will have gone ahead to gather useful intelligence. Sure. I'm team leader with the 13th Parachute Dragoon Regiment. And our regiment specializes in airborne reconnaissance. Hmm. That means intelligence gathering on targets to allow high-level decisions on interventions, actions, or whatever else. So we can descend into the field for a variety of reasons. Awesome. Information or intelligence gathering perhaps to confirm intelligence or information. It's human intelligence, actual site confirmation that will give an idea as to what's really happening. Dude, and of course, if you guys already don't know that when I switched to the army, I joined the uh, the army recon and uh, I was a platoon sergeant for that. And dude, that's just so much fun. Recon is a lot of dirty work and it's something that a lot of people just don't wanna do because it's a lot of walking around it's a lot of being uncomfortable. It's a lot of being. It's a lot of you know being stealthy and just being in the worst terrain possible, so the enemy doesn't detect you. So a lot of people just don't want to do that because they just want to take like the easier routes. But man, it's so much fun. And when you get a good group of guys who are passionate about reconnaissance, then it really does come together. It is you know higher risk, especially for these guys when they're going ahead of the fights. Um, so it's it's really cool to see the recon aspect of everything. So I guess they use their helicopters to get inserted and then they probably move up to their actual like hide sites or wherever they're doing their like their observation posts or what have you. So very cool to see the recon aspect of everything. Again, it's always uh, nice to see those professional recon dudes. Always working in small groups, the men of the special forces need to be extremely versatile. Although they all share the same basic expertise, each of them has ultra specialist complementary skills. <laughs> ultra specialist. We have to be proficient in the air, at sea, on land, and on land there are a lot of different technical skills. So that requires a lot of training every year, which we can't do without. Otherwise, we lose our level of performance and end up at the enemy's level when we go into action. Mm. That's a good point. Oh, I see that in 1014. Within each group, we're completely autonomous. Each element of the group has their own specialism. The aim is to double up, even treble up if possible, so no one person has just one specialism. Okay, there we go. I was waiting for him to say that. Yeah, that's a, that's a big thing, especially in the U.S. military. It's hard to do sometimes because, you know, you have all these advanced schools and you like to send people to go to these advanced schools so they can get this special skill and bring it back to the unit. So me specifically, I was the hearse master, so I was the, uh, the fast rope and rappel insert and extract with a, because I also learned how to do spy rigging. So I was like the, uh, the company's expert for that. And I also did close quarter battle, so I was able to take that to my units. And I also went to the uh, subterranean combat course. So I, I learned how to do subterranean warfare. And you're able to bring those skills back to the units. But again, once I leave or once, you know, like if someone goes down or, or whatever it is, then it makes it harder to fulfill that role if you do need someone who has that level of expertise because it's much nicer and much, uh, benef much more beneficial to have two or three people that have that specific skill. So in case one person goes down, you can pick them up. But... Again, the, it's hard to get the advanced training for certain people, and it's hard to spread load it sometimes, so it's, uh, it's harder to get that going. But for special forces, you can imagine they probably have their own assets to make sure that that, that happens. We might lose a man in the field, so we need to be able to turn around and accomplish the mission we've been given. Mm -hmm. That's why our mission preparations are incredibly detailed and fine-tuned because we're aware of the danger we face. 
A commando action is by definition carried out by a small group. So everything has to be in order and we have to predict all the possible enemy reactions that we might encounter in the field. Mm -hmm. It means trying to think of every eventuality, even if it doesn't happen. But we'll give ourselves as much chance as possible to foresee all the little things that could go wrong in the mission. Yeah, so when you're tri- Oh, there's a helicopter outside my room too. So when you're planning for anything, you like to, at least in the Marine Corps, we have something called the MP COA and like MD COA or ML COA as well. So you have the enemy is most likely or the enemy's most uh, probable course of action, their most likely course of action, or their most deadly course of action. So that's stuff you're always gonna introduce in training so you can try and predict what the enemy's going to do in certain situations. But it definitely matters for these guys because again, they have a small team. They don't really have like that QRF on standby all the time, that quick reaction force. They don't really have that backup necessarily, especially when they're doing commando style operations and they're on their own. So it's very important for them to think about every little minute detail. We know the risk. It's identified in any case, but you don't necessarily go out on a mission with that in your mind. We can't allow ourselves to think about that necessarily. We know that's the risk. There's no such thing as zero risk. We know very well when we sign up for this kind of unit that the risk is there, and it'll be there for the whole time in any case. <laughs> Afghanistan, Mali, Central African Republic, the 11 units of the COS, a military asset in the service of the government, can intervene anywhere at any time. They intervene on the orders of the Army Chief of Staff alongside conventional forces. In the past, I've got home on a Friday night and then at 2 a.m. taken off for what's supposed to be two weeks and come back four months later without really knowing where we're going. <laughs> We're asked to carry out missions all over the world, and we're often called on to fly during operations, so we need a little extra experience. So I did nine months of external operations last year, eight months the year before that. We always work with the same people. We're a small unit. Even with the Army, Navy, and Air Force commandos, we all know each other. We live among ourselves. We're often completely self-sufficient. We do what's called nomados, so we live with them even on the ground. There you go. That's it right there. That's the spy rigging I was talking about. That's crazy how, again, I mean, it's cool that, you know, I'm able to actually add something to the point that we actually see it later on in the video. So, again, when you're talking about these, these special operations, special forces kind of guys, you need every possible, you know, method you can use for an insert or an extract, especially when you're talking about super odd terrain. So, you can see they're just inside a house. A helicopter came, they roped up, and now they're getting picked up out of there because a lot of times they might not want to go to a specific area. You know, it might make them a bigger threat. The train not might allow it. So, you know, that's just an option that they have. So, again, it's really cool to see to see them implementing everything that they, they can. With the intensive training and frequent military interventions, the men of the Special Forces are kept very busy and can be away from home most of the year, six months on average. Mm. What you have to understand is these are pretty thankless jobs, in the sense that you have to give so much. We have to give a lot professionally. It means a big personal investment because we all have families at home. That's normal, and we need that to give us a proper balance and be able to do our jobs. But life in the group is different because we spend all our time together. Most of the time, if you calculate over a year, you spend much more time with your men than with your family. So you need to have a kind of osmosis, much more than just cohesion. In reality, they're bonds of brotherhood more than anything. It's a good way of putting it. I got some sick shots for this video. We don't want any cowboys here. What gives us our strength is complementarity between people, being united. We have no individualists. We all have more or less the same calm profile. Often people from outside, civilians, friends or family have trouble understanding that motivation, that need to make commitment. And it's not actually easy to explain. 
I don't get tired of it because it's not going to last. I know that tomorrow, or maybe in two or three years, it'll be over, so I'm making the most of it. And that's what keeps you motivated. Because we know that one day it'll stop, and then we'll miss it, so we make the most of it. Hmm. Some very good points. It's much more than just a job. You have to choose your words, but it's really more a vocation than anything else. That's awesome. Wow, dude, what the heck? How did they get all these shots for this video? It's insane. Wow, that was a very awesome video. And if it's get if this gets copyright claimed, I'm not even gonna be mad because that was awesome. And again, if you guys haven't seen Special Forces, hopefully this was a good introduction. I think this was a great introduction for me, especially again we we saw like how they insert, how they extract, all the specialties they have. And it's awesome to hear their insight, how they're talking about how, you know, people aren't individuals. They don't want individuals for the special forces because they're going to be with each other more than they are, you know, their families and everything. So it's important to have people who can meld into the units and and be like autonomous together, sort of like a hive mind sort of thing. Um, but again, each person has their specialities and it's it's really cool to see how this all works together. And I can appreciate the mindset that he was talking about where a lot of people just wouldn't understand it and how a lot of people wouldn't really be willing to sacrifice, you know, their time and their family time to do certain operations like this, especially when you go when you get no recognition. So it takes a lot of special people to do something like this. And you can see with any sort of like uh, assessment or selection, they're not looking for individuals. They always want people who are team players because that's that's what they're going into when you're going through a selection process. You're going on to a team that's going to be smaller and more refined than the conventional forces. So you need people who are good at working together and working in these small teams and being autonomous and uh, I guess self-sufficient. So very awesome to check out. This is a very, very awesome video. Of course, I'll, I'll link the original video down in the uh, video description. So if you guys want to check it out on your own, feel free. It's awesome that it was in English and that it was uh, translated so they can spread that information and spread the love to us English speaking folk. But yeah, this is a very, very awesome video. I do hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about the French Special Forces. Again, the French military gets a lot of crap sometimes, but this has definitely reassured me that at least their Special Forces definitely know what they're doing. So again, let me know what you guys think in the comments section. If it's, this changed your mind and how you picture the French military or what have you, be cool to, to, to hear how it actually changed your uh, perspective on everything. But yeah, if you guys liked the video, hit that thumbs up. If you're not subscribed, definitely subscribe. I would definitely appreciate it. So again, I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. Keep those recommendations in the comments section. I know this video wasn't a recommendation, but it's cool for me to go off on my own and check out other videos based off of your recommendations. But again, I hope you guys enjoyed. That is it for this video. I will see you all in the next one.